Okay, so this is uh, part two of the lab again. Sorry for the little delay there, um, but this is part two of the lab, uh, lab one, reaction times for human motor control. So what we're gonna be doing here is investigating different systems that are involved in reacting um, to a task. Uh, so obviously when a task like a ball is approaching, there's all different stimuli. Sometimes the ball is approaching and you can see it. So it's then uh, your reaction to get out of the way and um, elicit an action on the appropriate muscles to one stabilize the body and to act on the agonist muscles to move it out of the way and also inhibit the antagonist to make sure that movement happens as fast as possible so while not a reflex per se because it's not subcortical it is um, very uh, subconsciously managed and another thing is that a whole bunch of systems are involved so obviously if you can see it coming the um, visual centers are involved, but sometimes you might not see it coming. You might have your back turned and you might hear somebody say, heads up on your left, and then you have to duck over to your um, right side or um, basically just out of their instructions and an auditory cue. So there's many different factors and many different systems at play that go into a reaction time task, and that's what this little mini series of experiments, because what you're gonna be doing five, is designed to address. Okay, so this is uh, part uh, two of the lab. Uh, reflexes and reaction times. If you haven't seen part one, patellar tendon, that should say part two. This is reaction times. We're going to do a couple different reaction time tasks. So we're going to need the same basic equipment. We're going to need our lab chart software. You guys will have lab chart reader to analyze the data. Our actual power lab data acquisition unit, which is shown here with our, our embedded amplifier. So it takes those signals, converts them to a digital readout we can analyze. We don't need the goniometer or tendon hammer. That's from the previous experiment. We just need the finger pulse transducer. This is a little membrane there. Uh, transducer under it and we need the uh, push button switch so it's just a little switch that you just tap on with your thumb um, we'll need some medical tape and again I always implore people to go back and look and read the lab um, if at all possible it walks you through step by step by step so if you read that one time through first again you're not gonna be doing the actual protocol but you'll understand a little bit more uh, what I'm saying as you work along with it so that uh, will give you some background on the reaction times and this is embedded within it. So it talks about different factors that affect reaction times being age, arousal, distraction, gender, practice. And we're going to investigate a couple of those today. There are some that are obviously uh, like fatigue induced through a longer protocol that we don't necessarily have time for in the labs and we're not going to be giving everybody stimulants in the lab um, to see how much their reaction times can decrease but knowing that ergogenic aids do decrease reaction times it makes sense why they're banned from the olympics things like that so again this is our power lab case we're going to go into the case and make sure that um, we have everything we need inside they're labeled so please keep everything um, intact and again we'll label them if there's anything missing from the actual power lab unit itself so opening it up everything we need for this lab is going to be in the top unit we're going to flip open the velcro strap there you can see that the actual power lab is already out and on the computer cart but we're going to reach in and we're going to grab that push button switch with the eight pin din connector so there we got that and then Jaden is also going to grab here the um, finger pulse transducer so it's like a little more sensitive um, transducer that has a little velcro strap on it so it's sensitive enough that if you put it around just your index finger or your middle finger it detects the pulse in your fingertip but we can use it for other tasks as well we're gonna make sure that our power lab unit is powered on and that the green light is on on the front um, we're gonna take our finger pulse transducer flip the velcro around the back it says to flip it up on the front to protect it it gets a little not sensitive yeah, enough if you do that it. there you go um, okay, and what we're gonna do is uh, plug our unit or our push button switch in, and then we're gonna plug our finger pulse transducer in. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna go and navigate to our settings file, going to this PC, C drive, users. You might see a whole bunch of users, everybody who's logged into those before, scroll all the way down to public, and then you're gonna find your settings file in there. This one is the reaction setting times file. So I won't go into this too much. This is some pre-recorded data and they're sort of navigating around, but this is what your reaction time setting will look like with, um, one sec, I'll pause this, pause this video and I'll switch to my pointer here. So we're gonna have our response up here and then our transducer here. So the way this is gonna work is the person who's sort of initiating the task is gonna tap on the transducer and the responder is gonna tap on the uh, thumb switch in response to that. 
So they are reacting to what is happening on the transducer. So the, the transducer needs to be plugged in so that we can initiate the task at different intervals. And the protocol is set up such that when the transducer is triggered, it um, detects that the voltage has gone over a certain threshold because the person has tapped on it, the um, experimenter, and then the participant is then tasked with reacting to that. So as soon as it goes above a certain threshold on the finger pulse transducer, it actually zeroes out the time at that point, and then that, all that, that allows us to see the difference in time between when that happened and then when the person reacted to it by pressing the, uh, by pressing the finger switch. Then, so this is our regular view or our uh, data chart view. Um, you, I'll show you how to do that in a second, but this is what's called a scope view. So you can see that they're all overlaid and you can see how variable this data is, but that's generally how it's going to be set up. You won't have any data to start, but then once you hit start once and have the person perform a couple of those tasks, you'll start to see this data populate on the screen. All right, I'll get my cursor back there. There you go. Uh, we can go through that now because I'll show that all in the analysis part. Um, okay, so pausing that for a second. Here's our uh, setup, and this is going to be our very first task, reacting whoop, reacting to a uh, regular visual cue. So the participant is sat facing the experimenter, and we'll get to that in just a second here. Okay, so Jaden is facing Kennedy. Kennedy's the experimenter here and the finger pulse transducer is taped down. He's at the ready with his thumb over the switch. His job is to react to whenever he sees her press that switch. So you can see that she's going at fairly random intervals. And the system will record for up to 0.7 seconds after, which should be ample time for a regular healthy uh, university age person to react to a task like this. So this one is simply a visual cue. The next one is reaction time with a warning, and these next ones have audio, so I'll be quiet for a second. Ready? 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 How many are we at? Seven. Ready? Ready? Ready. Okay, so you could hear in that one that um, reaction uh, with a uh, auditory cue, um, or like a preparatory cue, you could hear Kendra, the second experimenter, saying, ready? Kennedy would then hit the finger pulse transducer and Jane would react to it. So Jane has some premotor cortex um, sort of preparatory uh, circuits involved in that section. So he's actually priming the motor cortex to exert that reaction already. And you uh, hopefully will see through the data that that changes his ability to react a little bit better. The next one is reaction, reacting to predictable cues, so timed cues. We'll see how that went. So again, that one's a little tough because the person is reacting to a predictable cue. You don't want them anticipating it and trying to time it exactly with the pace of the other person hitting it. Um, there are a certain amount of minimum reaction times that you would know if the person hit it, for example, 0.0001 seconds after Kennedy hit the, uh, hit the finger pulse transducer, that would simply be too fast. It was a purely anticipatory reaction. They started their movement exactly when or even before Kennedy started hers. So there's no way that they were actually reacting to the button getting hit, if that makes sense. So remind the participant you are reacting to the button getting hit, even though you know the timing at which it's happening. Then the next uh, exercise, exercise four, is reaction time with a distracting task. This one is always super fun, not for the participant as much, um, a little stressful, um, but I think believe it's counting backwards from 100 by either fours or sevens. 93, 86, 79, 72, uh, 65, 58, um, 51, 44. So you can see that Jane was actually just completely missing some um, while he did that. And then finally, this one is going to be reacting to just the auditory cue. So sat facing away from the participant, all he's listening for is the little tap 
the little tap on the table, um, hearing that Kennedy has tapped on the finger pulse transducer. Okay, so that's um, pretty much what I have for the video. We'll take a look at some of the data now. Um, the first thing I'll probably say is get your Excel sheet prepped um, and uh, I'll pull up the lab beside it to know that um, in our data collection sheet, this is what it has labeled. And just so I don't cover what I'm doing, um, I can set up the exact same sheet with our visual cues, uh, with our auditory warning our predictable cues with distraction and our auditory cues. Again, you're gonna be taking the mean and standard deviation of all these. So if I double click there, I can see that I've already created the average of all of those. And just a reminder that if you um, write that in your one cell and you drag them over, you don't have them uh, 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 cell locked with dollar signs. So they will all drag over appropriately and you will have the appropriate column um, averaged. For standard deviation, make sure you use standard deviation of the sample, not the population. It's not a huge deal, but it's a little bit different calculation. And again, we can drag those over. Lastly, just like I mentioned in the previous video, if you ever need to check what you're doing, um, you can hit control and the little squiggly line under, um, under the escape button there. And I'll just zoom out a little bit. And what that does is that actually uh, comments out any place which you have a, um, a function in Excel uh, denoted starting with the equal sign. So you can see where all those are and then you can click on them just like we did before. But in case that these are filled with numbers and the rest of your sheet is filled with numbers and you want to remember oh which, which ones were written function and which ones were um, input uh, raw numbers, then that's an easy way to see it. So just hitting control and the squiggly button line takes you back out of that. And that's our data collection sheet there. So we're, when we're going to be writing in our data collection sheet, we're going to be using that there. Okay, now that we know what that is, I can put that over behind me there. And maybe I'll even just, I'll insert some rows above here. So it moves down a little bit. Okay, so now that those are inserted and it's sort of below me without messing too much with my streaming software, I can go in, I'm going to pull up my data. So you guys will have a data file which is in the comments section or the description of the video, um, not only on Canvas but also on YouTube if you ever want to go back and access the data. So then we have them labeled Motor Control Lab Exercise 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and that corresponds to the appropriate um, exercise in the lab either uh, with visual cues, with preparatory audio cues, etc. So um, we'll go ahead and I'll open the first one. I won't do a whole bunch of these. Oh, it says I already had that one open. So um, I won't save the changes out. We'll make sure that it opens correctly just so you see what happens. Um, sometimes this happens if you're using the full version of lab charts as you don't have one plugged in or you're using an unlicensed module, um, metabolic module for me. I don't think you guys will have that issue, but just click don't load because we don't, we don't um, are, aren't using that one right now. Uh, the next thing is in chart view, you have these little uh, pop-up buttons. We only really use those in collection. And then we can sort of orient ourselves to the data here. So if I come on over and make this a little smaller, I can slide that out and then we can take a look at our data a little bit better here. We actually don't need the third channel at all. It's not collecting anything on this. And you can see that in chart view, even though like in the other video how I taught you, you can zoom in, it might get a little tedious, especially with 10 trials on here to slide your cursor along Again, I'm mainly looking at the red line here and look at for that increase. So that very first signal of when we got a um, when we got an increase in the reaction time from Jaden. So we can see that up here, we'll be able to see the difference in time. So as I drag my waveform cursor along, I can see that that one starts to pop up at exactly 0 0.118 seconds. Then I'll do the next one. Zero point one 
0 0.134 and what you're going to be doing is you're going to be you're going to be typing 18 0 0.134 you're going to be typing those in your excel sheet as you go so the other view that came up that i'll talk to you guys about so this is our chart view that's what we're looking at here and again our chart view we can zoom in and out horizontally also vertically you can see that when I auto scale this the uh, finger pulse transducer goes off the screen that's kind of what's known as clipping again in other signals we would care about that more but because this is simply a reactionary task which is then triggering the other person the timing of it it's not really changing because it's setting a threshold that it's already going above that so we don't really care about the peak of this signal but normally we would care if something goes out into the gray areas like this but um, we can again, yeah, scale the Y, skip, uh, move in by dragging it and moving it around. We can scale the X by using this, um, these sort of ratios here, zooming out if in a 20 to one and zooming in on a one to one. Um, but the other thing we can do is in a task that happens many, many times like this, you might want to use scope view. So what that is, is it's essentially an overlay. It can work in 10 section blocks um, and I believe there's a way to make these blocks actually bigger but right now we want to do 10 because there's no comments in this one but if I go back up to my chart view here um, and zoom out you will notice that they wrote the appropriate comments when we ask people to comment so they've commented that the first 10 belong to Casey and when we do this in person we have multiple people do it then the next 10 belong to Devante and the last 10 uh, belong to Callan. So um, we can go back into scope view and you can either do this in chart view or in scope view but in scope view you can see that I'm on page one the first trial you can see that zero seconds is there and as I scroll along I'm looking at the top this one's in milliseconds it's not in a decimal of a second so 118 milliseconds if I do the second one I do the same thing 130 four milliseconds and you would go through and do the same thing so 137 128 134 113 before I forget those Ooh, 0 0.127 0 0.138 point one two four what was that one last one one three four again one one four whoop three four one one four it's a fast one eighty one ninety nine 134. I don't know why I keep opening File Explorer. 0, 081, 0, 099, 0.134, and for our tenth one, 0 0.183. 0 0.183. Eight, okay, so you'll see our meet. We have our mean here, and our. Oh, I overwrote that one. Okay, so you'll see we have our mean here and our standard deviation. That's what you're going to be reporting, but you'll notice in the lab that it does tell you to eliminate the uh, largest, so I'll bold that out, and the smallest, so I'll bold that one out. So you can do this one of two ways. You can either just simply delete those from the table, um, but it, as an experimental sort of best practices, something I would always recommend is not necessarily deleting that data, but leaving it out of your mean calculation. So if we want to change what our average is, um, I can delete that. And then now that I have these bolded, I can know that I can highlight those. And then you can add either a comment and or a comma and then add to this. Or what we can do is to select, keep selecting. Um, we can then hold control and then select our next ones um, and that will add those two together and bring them both into that mean. Uh, we're going to do the same thing for our standard deviation. Again I'm holding control on the keyboard while I'm doing that and then that way you can see that you have your average taken from the sum of all those numbers. 
um, and you still have your data for the smallest and the largest you still have your data from the smallest and the largest left in the table so if anybody asks you to go back and say oh what was the total range you would be able to say oh outliers were removed but the total range before that was um, from 0 0.81 or 81 milliseconds to 183 milliseconds so that's sort of just like a little best practices and getting used to using excel after this i believe the lab calls for you to go in and graph that um, but i'll let you youtube how to graph an excel I'll plot in excel tons of videos on that um, again, yeah, that's uh, you should be able to do that all in Lab Chart Reader. Just getting comfortable with looking at the data, how we sort of present it, going back back and forth between scope view, chart view, and really you're just again reading off the seconds for this one here. Reaction time is almost always measured in seconds. There is no amplitude of the specific tasks that we're doing. So that's uh, part two of Lab One. And thanks for being so patient and me uh, getting it going. Have a good one, guys.